The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's pray. O Lord, that is the song of our heart and the celebration of our life, that we live because of your faithfulness. We are here, we live and move, we breathe because of your faithful provision for us. And we are thankful for how you have prepared this day for us to enter and all that it will bring. And when we get to the end of the day and reflect on it, we'll be able to think about the ways that we have experienced your faithful care, your guidance, your protection, and your love. So this morning we come to give these moments to you. We gather around your throne. We want to sit at your feet. We want to hear your voice. We want to be encouraged as we go forth and live for you and the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Welcome and thanks for joining us for the online ministry of the First Congregational Church of Wyndham. We're thankful to continue to come to you online on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, WyndhamCenteredChurch.com website. Uh, even as I'm thankful for that, I still encourage you when you're able to come and join us in person at 10 o'clock for the rest of the summer. Uh, there is nothing that replaces the ability to praise with other voices and to, to see one another, to hear one another, and to participate together as the body of Christ. I hope that you will join us. Throughout the rest of the summer, we are continuing to encourage gifts through the use of these little bottles for a Caring Families Pregnancy Services. It's a way that uh, we can minister to women at, at a most vulnerable time in their lives as they're dealing with pregnancies. And uh, it is your generosity that helps this ministry continue women to find hope and find life in Christ. We received some communication this week concerning the Covenant Soup Kitchen, uh, a very uh, vital ministry in the greater Willimantic area. Um, we'll have a list of items and supplies that they're in need of, but if you are able to contribute to uh, that ministry through uh, a mail-in cash or mail-in offering or something, you know, please, you, know, you can send something to us, go right on their website and, and take care of that there, but their needs um are very, very great. The scriptures this morning, the first we are reading through uh, selected passages in the book of Isaiah, and we are reading together through Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. And right now we come this morning to Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40, and uh, the verses are 1 through 11. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up and fear not and say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. His arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And then turning to Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 12. 
Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more even in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you also shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray together. Lord, the passage in Isaiah proclaims Jesus as our king and Jesus as our shepherd. And I can't think of an image that we love more dearly than to think of Jesus as our shepherd who holds his sheep in his arms and tenderly cares for those that are young. Lord, we love that image and it just teaches us of the compassion and the kindness The personal attention, as as a shepherd knows the names of each of his sheep, as a shepherd has a personal attachment, feels personally bound to each sheep, has a personal responsibility uh, to keep that sheep healthy and well. So Lord Jesus uh, carries that similar uh, attitude towards us as his sheep. He knows us by name. He knows the circumstances of our lives, and he knows how to carry us. He knows how to take care of us. And Lord, we are so thankful uh, for that today. Lord, as, as we're praying, we think of the coup over in Niger that has been ta- has taken place. Our, our brother Daoud uh, lives in the capital of Niger, Niamey, and the seat of government, and It's not completely clear all that has taken place, but uh, those who have deposed the the elected president um, want to impose more harsher Islamic teaching on others. They're not happy with all that he's done. And Lord, we just pray for the protection uh, of those who simply want to serve you and know you. Pray, Father, for Daoud and his family. The the borders are closed, so he can't get to some of his family, and and people are not able to go into any of the surrounding countries. I pray that Daoud would be a strong witness of faith. You do not promise us that life will always be easy. In fact, you guarantee that our lives here will sometimes be very hard. But in that, you never stop being the shepherd whom we need. And so I pray that Daoud and his family would have great strength to show people how people who trust Jesus can live, even in the face of uh, of upheaval, even in the face of danger. Lord, we bring them to you uh, for that. Father, we think of so many things going on in the world around us. There are, there are things in the physical world, our political world, our economic world, our, our relational world, ways that we personally struggle. And we ask, Lord, that you would comfort us, that you would strengthen us, that we would keep looking to you and trusting you um, with our lives. And Lord, I, we want to lift up again our brother Michael's family as a uh, in another week, we will be coming together for the memorial celebration of his life. We thank you for the example that he has been of just a simple, gentle, faithful, strong, generous follower of Christ. And we want to celebrate that and learn from that and seek to, to, to imitate the life that he lived as a follower of Jesus. Pray for his family and for you to comfort them today. Um, they know that he's with you, Lord. They, they know. And uh, as much as they miss him, 
They're so thankful that he's with you now. I just pray for your peace and your strength and, and our opportunity uh, to continue to reach out to them in love. Lord, there are many in our circles of relationship who are struggling in different ways. And would you hear us now as in the quietness of these moments, we bring them to you. Hear us, our Father. Thank you for the invitation to cast our cares on you and the promise that you care for us. We leave these with you now. We ask that you would use us to be a blessing to the people for whom we've prayed. And we will thank you for that now in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Isaiah writes this, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord our God is an everlasting rock. The word of the Lord. The last time that we were together, we faced death as Christians. We faced death with the declaration of faith. It is what the Bible teaches us. It is what we profess as believers. It is what we declare. We believe in the resurrection. And because we believe in the resurrection, we believe in the resurrection of Christ from the dead, that on a day in time and history, the dead body of Christ was resurrected to glorious life and Jesus left the tomb. He has ascended to heaven and he sits there until he comes home, to, comes back uh, for us. We believe in the resurrection of Christ. And because we believe in the resurrection of Christ, we believe in the promised resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of every believer in Christ, not unto death, but to everlasting life. And until that happens, we believe that for a believer to be, to be absent here, absent from the body, as Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and in fellowship, even with the saints who have gone before. We believe that because that is what God says happens. That is what God does. That is what God makes happen. Why? Because he has promised it. He's promised it to us in the scripture. And because he who promises it is faithful, and he who promises it, it is strong, we believe that he will make it so. So we trust him. Isaiah called us to trust him in these verses. Hear them again, just two. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord our God is an everlasting rock. The God who makes the promises of resurrection, the God who promises to be the one that we can trust forever, loves to describe himself and that others describe him with this very singular word, the everlasting rock. Our resurrection confidence is built on God, our rock. And you know, we sing as the end of our service today, and as you will see on the playlist, the final song, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. The world is sinking and shaking all around us, whether it's the literal earthquakes that are taking place or some volcanic activity or the rains that are bringing the floods or uh, pestilence or climate change. 
it's not only in, in the natural world, but in our culture, in our society. The wars that continue, uh, the coups like we uh, have learned of this week over in Niger, economic struggles, political struggles, all of the division and the hostility causing so much stress and so much anxiety and leading to violence in different places. On top of that is disease and, and death, um, sorrow, sorrow, depression, all of the interpersonal conflict. And in truth, as Christians, you and I are not spared from having to walk through those days. We're never promised that because we're a believer, we are not going to walk through those days right alongside all of our neighbors. We don't have that getaway free card. But rather, Paul has a different perspective for us in Romans chapter 8. He talks about the sufferings of this world, and, and he indicates that there are going to be sufferings in this world. Romans 8, 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time. What sufferings are those? Those are the sufferings that we endure in this present time. Those are the sufferings that we live with, that we endure. Some of them go away quickly and some of them we have to deal with for years. But he says, I consider the sufferings that we endure in this present day. They're not even worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us in Christ. No, as believers in Christ, the God who promised the resurrection also promises to sustain us now. The God who promised our future resurrection and our presence with him forever promises to sustain him now. Hear these words from Romans 8, beginning with verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with Christ give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? The implication is that God might, but the answer is God instead is the one who justifies. Who would condemn us? Perhaps the idea is that Jesus would condemn us, but Paul goes on to say, well, not Christ. Jesus is not the one who condemns. He is the one who died. And more than that, who was raised, who is seated at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a massive word picture and teaching to us of what it means for us to depend upon our rock. It is to believe his promises are true and, and to know who he is so that then we can believe what he says. The, the word that God frequently uses in describing himself, and it's a, it's a word that underlies his ability to deliver what Paul has just promised to us, God is our rock. Friends, when our hearts grieve over death, we stand on the rock-solid promise of the resurrection. When we are grieved and troubled, and shaken as uh, the songs go, as the, as the earth moves under our feet, or there's a whole lot of shaking going on, we stand on the rock. I mentioned that this word rock is one of God's favorite words uh, in his self-description and as people refer to him. And, and especially in the Psalms, there are so many references to God as rock, I, I, too many to read, but I do want to read a few. And I'm sure they're familiar to you, but, but listen afresh and listen to how David and others uh, do this. And after the Psalms, we're going to look at Moses and then another verse from Paul. 
Psalm 31, in you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me. You are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O faithful God. And then Psalm 61, 1 to 3. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. And then the next Psalm 62 verses 1 and 2, and then 5 through 8. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. My hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Before I go to the verses in Deuteronomy that Moses wrote, a word about the Psalms, as David was the author of those psalms, um, many of them come from times when he would have been fleeing in the wilderness. It might have been from Saul when Saul was trying to kill him. It might have been from other enemies. But, but it's pictures that the rough terrain of much of, of Israel, the, the, the rocky ground, the, the cliffs, the high, the high hills, and the, the rock provided a place of advantage. The, the rock would have been elevated and the rock could provide a, a shelter that David could hide behind. The, the rock might also lead to, to a cave where, where David would find uh, a place to rest. And so David has a very visible picture of that. And he, he applies the principles of that physical rest and physical protection to God himself as God cares for him. Certainly, those are ways that you and I can learn to trust in the Lord as well. In the book of Deuteronomy, as Moses is wrapping up this message, getting before he passes and uh, the people go into the promised land, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 and 4. I will proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect. All of his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. You know, faithfulness, as we sang, or as we mentioned it this morning, as we open, that's something that is just rich in God's character that has been celebrated. And then down to verse 15. Jeshurun, which is another name for Israel, grew fat and kicked. You grew fat and stout and sleek, and you forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation and stirred him to jealousy with strange gods and with abominations. They provoked him to anger. Verse 18, you were unmindful of the rock who bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. Do you see the connection with the rock as really representing the character and the nature of God? And God, as that stable person, brought forth his people, but they spurned him and they turned to the same idols that the peoples around them were worshiping. And, and that would cost them very, very dearly. Now, Paul takes that principle for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And he reflects back on a time when Israel had rejected God, their rock. 
1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What Paul is teaching is that everything that God was in this nature as the rock of his people through the wilderness is what Jesus is for us today. And he's encouraging the Corinthians and an encouragement that we need to continue to rest in Christ, to continue to trust in Christ. Jesus brings directly to you and to me everything that is in the rockness, if you will, of God. All that God is pictured in the strength of the rocky fortress, but that's an, as an impersonal uh, picture. Jesus is for us personally and in our relationship to him. So when we talk about God being our rock, what is it that we mean when we say God is our rock? Well, it's important to us today to understand that question because as we saw, as Israel forgot over and over, even though know, God had done so much for them, they forgot over and over. We have that tendency too, don't we? Well, the song certainly says it, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. When was the last time you just forgot about God? When was the last time that you wandered off, you kind of knew where you were going, you just stopped paying any attention? Our hearts, even, even born in Christ, there's still something in our hearts that wants to do, go off in our own way. Um, and so we need that just as well. Bible teacher Clarence Hayes calls out four different principles in an article that he wrote about what do we mean when we say God is my rock. And my, my hope over these next weeks as we go into August before we resume our normal schedule in the fall is to, is to think about what it means for God to be our rock in our own lives, in our church fellowship, and for the world. Uh, Clarence Hayes um, mentions a few. He talks about God being the rock of our salvation, God being the rock of our foundation, God being the rock of our protection. All of those are in verses that we've already read today. Excuse me, there's a certain sense of overlap and blending between them, but we're going to try to focus on each one. The one that I, I choose for this morning is that God is our rock of refuge and our strength. God is our rock of refuge and our strength. You heard it a number of different times uh, in the verses that we read. Perhaps the most famous psalm that speaks of that is a Psalm 46. It doesn't exactly use the word rock of God, but it definitely uses the word refuge. God is our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains swell at its trembling. God is our refuge. If you were to open a concordance and look for the word refuge and turn to the Psalms, you will see refuge from first to last. God loves that. God, that is so important that the Father wants for us to know it, that it, it's there over and over and over and over again. And our refuge is a rock. A refuge is a rock. What does that mean? A rock, a refuge is a place that you can go to be safe. It is a place that you can hide. It is a place to go for safety or a person to trust for safety. God is a shield to all who take refuge in him. We take refuge in the shadow of his wings. If you go to a dictionary and look at the word refuge, it's interesting to see the others. And a number of these are in scripture. Uh, God is a shelter to us. The Lord's our rock. In him we stand a shelter in the time of storm. 
I think of the of the song Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. There was a preacher, Augustus Toplady, and he lived in England. It was in the 1800s, and, and he was traveling from one engagement to another. And as he was traveling, the skies just opened up, like, like some of the rainfalls that we've had here over the last few weeks. And, and it was just a massive, massive downpour. And as he was walking through this area, to his side of a cliffside, there was a, a cleft in the rock. And he backed into that rock, and, and he had a very pictorial mind as he thought about this rock that was cleft for him, and it pictured to him the protection that God is, that Jesus is a refuge for us, shelter, a picture in life's storms. Jesus would be a shelter to us in life's storms. Another word not in scripture is asylum. Uh, asylum is a place where people can flee. Often um, they have issues, maybe some legal issues or some other issues, and they need some protection. I think in the book of Leviticus, there's three cities of what's called refuge, easily be called cities of asylum. If, if you inadvertently killed someone, you could flee to one of these cities and it would demonstrate that it was an accident. You really didn't do anything in purpose. And that would be a place of asylum for you. God is our asylum. God is our sanctuary. God is a harbor. God is a home or, or a safe house. You know, we think of that as you think about a place where abused and battered women and children might flee, a home where they are safe, where they are protected, and where they are cared for. It is a refuge from the violence and, and the struggle that they have been experiencing. God is a fortress, a refuge, a fortress. That's a very strong fort. It's a place to hide. It's a place to regain your strength. We, we read about that. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And as you read those next verses, those are unimaginable events. The, the mountains fall into the hearts of the sea and the waters roar and foam. Um, those are very, very fearful events. Another word for, for refuge is a, is a hiding place a place to hide and be safe. I hear that word and I can't help but think of the, of the great story of Corey Ten Boom who lived in Holland in the Second World War and he and her family, she and her family uh, built a false wall in the back of their home and they enabled Jews escaping persecution and death to hide there until a transfer could be made and they could escape. Unfortunately, a mole had come in and betrayed them, and so they went off into the concentration camp. But the, the wonder of Cory Ten Boom's story is that God was still her hiding place, even while she was in the concentration camp. God's protection, God's watch, God's provision over her. So she experienced God as hiding place as they offered it to people, but also as she endured the, the uh, everything that was going on in the camp. An oasis, a haven. So you think about God, all of those words can apply to him. Can you think of a time in your life when one of those concepts really came into play? Can you think of a way that God ministered to you and you experienced his commitment to you? You experienced how he sustained you. You experienced the peace that comes from that. In each of those places, it can be a place of welcome. It's a place where people receive you. It, it is a place where there is hospitality and needs are cared for. It's a place where for a while you can set your fears aside because the fears are outside and you are inside. It's a place of safety. It's a place of rest. It can be a place of fellowship with other people, other harassed life travelers, where, where you can share your own stories and try and be encouraged. You can unburden and you can hear how others have been provided for. It's a place to be relieved from the face of your enemies and where they would seek to do you harm. 
all of those things in those places of refuge. For David, many of those things took place in the physical places of refuge that David found, and, and he knew that God had provided them. They were gifts from him. But you and I, we may not need those physical places as much as the spiritual place where, where the body of Christ and fellowship with another believer becomes that place of refuge where you can come. And, and you can do what the, the whole purpose of this is. It is to trust. To trust in the Lord again. What have we read? Lord, in you I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. I have trusted you, Lord. Don't betray my trust. Do what I have trusted you to do. Don't let me down. Isn't our world full of broken trust? It is full of broken promises. It is full of, of people who, who let one another down. Well, do you have a particular experience that comes to mind of a broken promise or someone that you trusted in that had taken advantage of you? Someone has raised the question, well, can we trust God at all? I mean, he let it happen. He, you know, these things that happen in our families and in our jobs and our health and our circumstances, God let them all happen. Well, as we said, that is the way of the world. And God does not protect us from all of those things. He does promise to be with us. As we trust in God, it's an opportunity to pray. And as an opportunity to pray, it's an opportunity to tell God exactly what we're going through. But one of the things I appreciate so about the Psalms is David didn't have any problem telling God exactly what he was feeling. Um, you might not feel comfortable writing some of those words, but I encourage you to use them uh, in your prayers if that represents exactly how you feel. Saying the hard things to God or saying the hard things to another believer, to, to pour out your disappointment, to, to pour out your sorrow, and that another believer would hopefully listen to you. Not try to fix all your problems, not try to put spiritual band-aids on them, but, but listen and seek to be there to encourage. Jesus understands. Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was denied. Jesus was abandoned. Jesus lost absolutely everything when he went to the cross. Can you or I lose more than Jesus lost? Of course not. And I, I just share that to say Jesus understands. He, he gets that and he knows us. When I think about all of these kinds of things, my heart always turns to a 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul, after having a great experience of exaltation, God allows what he calls a messenger of Satan into Paul's life to torment him. And Paul describes it as to keep him from being arrogant and to keep him from being proud. And, and Paul says, three times I asked the Lord to remove it, and three times God said no. And the reason he said no was this. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all more gladly of my weakness, so the power of Christ may rest in me. For the sake of Christ, then, when I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Because Paul is strong in the grace of Christ. And the grace of Christ is truly the rock on which we stand. As we trust the Lord and as we speak to him, as, as we learn to let go of the things that are such burdens to us, you know, figuratively, we can place them in the Lord's hands and entrust them there. But if you've been around very long, you know that one of my favorite and go-to passages is from Psalm 31, where David, we read from there earlier, David says this, I trust in you, O Lord, I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. My times are in your hands. Jesus in John 10 speaks of a similar thing. And when he says he's the great shepherd, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. 
They are in my hands. They are in my Father's hands. It is a place of peace. It's a place of rest. It's a place of confidence, friends, that you and I can know that we live in the hands of the Lord Jesus. That is a personal picture of what we call Jesus our, our rock, a refuge that will not let us go. If you have trusted Christ, when a person trusts Christ, you died with him on the cross, you were buried with him in the tomb, you were raised with him from the dead, you ascended with him to heaven, and you are seated in Christ at the right hand of God the Father Almighty until Jesus comes back. Life is secure. You, your life, you are with the Lord. But, but now... You and I then live with a life that is securely planted on the rock that is the Lord Jesus. Spurgeon said, thinking of Psalm 46, which we read earlier, as long as God is God, there is no cause for you and I as believers to fear, but rather we seek to rest him, rest in him. It doesn't do us any good knowing that God is our rock, that Jesus is our rock, if we do not choose to rest there. If we do not choose to draw near, if we do not choose to trust him, if we do not come to him, if we don't pour our heart out to him, if we don't give him the opportunity to show us, because it's not in the academics, it's not in the head knowledge. It's wonderful to be able to say these words. But like we spoke last time about the resurrection, it's all fine to say, you know, I believe in the resurrection, I believe in the resurrection. But, but do we say, I know that I know that I know that I know that Jesus has risen, that I will rise too. Can we say, I know that God is my rock, that when I say you are my refuge and my fortress, you are my rock of refuge. Lord, you are the haven of my life. Lord, you are the asylum of my life. You are the harbor of my life. You are the place that keeps me safe. You are the person who keeps me safe. In my broken relationships, in my heartache, in my hardship, in my loss. My hope for you, certainly my hope for me, is to continue to learn to rest in the Lord as the rock of my life. I hope the rock of your life today as we have thought about it in the rock of refuge. But us resting in the Lord, as we've said so many times, it's not just for our sake. It's not just for our sake. There's, a, there's an old hymn that was written. It's called Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. And, and it was written uh, about the port of Cleveland and an event that took place there. Um, D.L. Moody uh, related the story at one of his meetings of a shipwreck on a dark and tempestuous night in the Cleveland area of Ohio. The ship was approaching the harbor, and there was a pilot on board. But as they were coming, the captain of the ship only saw one light, and it was the light of the lighthouse. And he asked the, the captain asked the pilot if he was sure that that was Cleveland Harbor, because the, there were lower lights that were not burning, that should have been burning. Well, the pilot was absolutely certain that that upper light was Cleveland's harbor. And so, well, then go for it. And so they went in, but it wasn't Cleveland's harbor. And they crashed into the shore, and unfortunately, in that storm, many lights were lost. Moody made this appeal. The master will take care of the big light that guides our way. He will take care of the lighthouse. But friends, it's our responsibility to let what they call the lower lights be burning. The lights that showed the people out in the storm where there was harbor. For you and I, the, the lights represent our lives and that we are the lights of Christ to show people out in the storm of life and all that's going on, here's where the rock is. Not, not the rock you avoid on the boat, but the rock you come to as a 
person. Here is the one that you can depend upon. And, and the hymn is keep the lower lights. Let the lower lights be burning. Keep being people who shine out what Jesus is doing in our lives. Keep being people who help other people find the security of the Lord Jesus. The Lord is our rock. In him we stand. Shelter in the time of storm. He is our rock of refuge, a strong fortress, so that into his hand we can commit our spirit and trust him. Let's pray. Lord, as, as we live in this particular age, we observe people who once seemed to walk with you, once seemed to be active in your fellowship. Many across our land, across the world, deciding they're not interested anymore. And uh, I don't know what all the cause of that is. Perhaps some of that is uh, discouragement. Perhaps some of that is example that other Christians have set for them. Perhaps their lives have hit the, the rocks of life, been oppressed by the storms of life, and they, they hadn't ever really found the true rock of refuge to base their life on. Lord, there, there may be people whom we know who are so battered, who are so weary, who are so deeply struggling and sorrowful. And it's not our place to just shine a floodlight in their eyes, but it is our place to live in a way and give words that, that give them hope. And so we pray, Lord, that, that we would learn more and more to really rest on you and to trust you with our lives. You will give us no reason for shame. You will never fail us or forsake us, but will keep us till the end. So we want to thank you for that today. Help us to rest in you as our rock of refuge, to trust in you, and help us, Lord, to be attuned to someone who needs to know that and would grasp for it if we would but let them know. And so strengthen us toward that. Perhaps there's a way, a very specific thing that we need to trust you in right now. And Lord, just meet each one here in that crisis, in that need, that we might know that you are our rock of refuge. And we will thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining us today. If you haven't already, I hope that you will use the songs and the playlist. Uh, we share them each week as worship tools and things that you can take with you. You can listen to them over and over and over again and just make those songs your own. Because sometimes the, the word in scripture is great, but when it's put to music and the theme is there, it's something that you carry around and, and you remember. So God bless you today and strengthen you as you walk in the world. Thank you. Bye.